Welcome to the Nick Bryant Podcast. Today, my guests are Drs. Marita Pelinova and Philip Casalino. Dr. Pelinova is an assistant professor of psychiatry and neurobehavioral sciences at the University of Virginia's Division of Perceptual Studies. And Dr. Casalino is an associate professor of psychiatry at the Division of Perceptual Studies. How are you two doing today? Doing well. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks, thanks for, for having us, Nick. Thanks for being on the Nick Bryant podcast. In case my guests don't know about the amazing work that the Department of Percep Division of Perceptual Studies has done, I'll kind of clue them in a little bit. The University of Virginia's Division of Perceptual Study was founded in 1967 by Dr. Ian, Dr. Ian Stevenson. And it is devoted to rigorous evaluation of empirical evidence for extraordinary, extraordinary human experiences and capacities. The primary focus of the Division of Perceptual Studies is investigating the mind's relationship to the body and the possibility of consciousness surviving death. In general, this process involves studying phenomena that challenge mainstream scientific paradigms regarding the nature of human consciousness. Thus far, the Division of Perceptual Studies has been able to corroborate 2,500 cases of reincarnation, and it's also compiled a considerable registry of near-death experiences. So who would like to start off first talking about your experience with the Division of Perceptual Studies? Go ahead, Marietta. I will go first. So. Um... I was lucky to join the Division of Perceptual Studies in 2017, right after I completed my graduate studies in experimental psychology. And since then, I've worked primarily on near-death experiences and also cases of children's purported past life memories. And that latter topic has uh, has been one of the main topics started started here in terms of investigations in the 60s and is, I guess, the bread and butter of this operation. And that work, as you mentioned, was started by Dr. Ian Stevenson, who had become uh, very intrigued by these cases of little kids who appear to talk about past life memories. And Philip, give us a little background about how you became to be involved with the Division yeah. of Perceptual Studies. Certainly. Um, so I am a, uh, I got my PhD in 2006 at uh, the University of Minnesota in psychology. And I spent uh, 20 years roughly in a, a sort of a mainstream psychology career, uh, publishing in social psychology and personality psychology journals. I worked at the University of Essex for 17 years in England. And uh, the bulk of that time, even though it was uh, mainstream psychology, I, I was incorporating lessons that had been learned by uh, our now my now colleague and Marietta and my uh, our, our colleague, Bruce Grayson, and near-death experience researchers, uh, including Kenneth Ring at Connecticut, and basically employed some of all uh, what they had learned about a near-death experience and how it impacted near-death experiencers after the event into a model of human psychology that we could, you know, you didn't have to have a near-death experience to come to terms with your mortality and potentially even grow and, and have a better outcome for your life by basically confronting death honestly and, and getting past fears of it. So all of that 20 years, I was flirting with and uh, butting up against uh, DOPS related research in terms of near-death experiences. Um, and then when my, uh, you know, my time at Essex, I decided to end my job there, uh, my tenure job, I walked away from it because it was no longer satisfying. And then the post opened up at DOPS and I applied for it. And fortunately, I was hired and um, I've been here about 14 months and it's been the most amazing, uh, exciting 14 months in my long 20 plus year career. So that's a, a decent outcome. And, and like I said, to be honest, I mean, Bruce's work, Bruce Grayson's work, is a lot of what gave me the gravitas. I wrote my first paper mentioning near-death experiences in mainstream psychology when I was a grad student, and it was his work that enabled me to say, look, medical journals are talking about this. We can talk about this. We can learn from it. And to now have come full circle to actually be a colleague of his here, it's 
it's remarkable. I will just for a point of clarity's sake, and I think it would, I'm sure Marietta will agree with me, just it's 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 more than semantics to us. I wouldn't be I want I wouldn't say that we have corroborated 2,500 cases of past life memory research. I would say that Dobbs has investigated and and documented and, inve and and spent a good deal of time trying to make sense of those cases. Now, again, not trying to play semantics, but corroborated to me. I just want to be careful that we're we're trying to still make sense of what all of this means. Gotcha. Well, you've got the case of James Leininger, and he's one of the more famous cases of reincarnation that Dops has looked into. And would you say that that case, could you give us some background on that case? And I kind of think that Leininger's case is corroborated, that you've been able to corroborate it. It's, it's a remarkable case. It's a, our, our former director, Jim Tucker, it was one of his cases. He took over really the bulk of those investigations when Ian Stevenson uh, was retiring. And, and Jim focused on American cases. That was his uh, particular focus. And James Leninger is one of those. He had a number of others. Um, and it is, it's a remarkable case. So yeah, I will step through some, it, it can go on. So I'll try to be as brief as possible just to give you a sense. Now, to be clear with James Leininger's case, um, Jim Dops came to that case after a lot of the evidence had already been collected. And most of that evidence was collected. All the statements that the child made were documented by his father, his parents, and his father particularly set out taking note of all of this because he was the father, a devout Christian who thought it was bunk. He was like, this is not reincarnation. This is not past life memories. I'm going to demonstrate. So he sought to actually make it go away, if you will. But every time he would hear his son say something, he would sort of follow that down a path that would lead him to, oh, wait a second, that's interesting. So what happened? Two, roughly two years old, they take James to a Dallas museum. Uh, and it's a world, part of the museum is an aircraft, uh, airplane museum. And part of it had a World War II exhibit. And James, a two plus year old, became just uh, fascinated and wouldn't leave this World War II area and started making some comments about planes and parts of planes. He called something about a, it's called a drop tank, but he, in a child's language, called it a dwop tank. He couldn't say the R's like a lot of children. And someone there said, yeah, that's right. That is what that's called. And then they they left and they didn't think too much of it, but he he begged them to go back there again, not long after, some months later. And it was at that uh, second visit that he started getting very emotional about the World War II plane exhibits and started again making statements that people who were there suggested the boy was accurate. He was naming parts of planes and it, it describing uh, certain types of aircraft, Corsairs, he was naming them, even though at that time there weren't uh, Corsairs at the museum, uh, but they were flown in World War II. So the father started really... Uh, getting in, interested and again started to try to debunk that this was potentially a past life quickly it got very emotional for the family um james would have started having regular often many times a week nightmares that would wake his parents up he would be screaming in his bed you're talking about a two three-year-old boy screaming about uh plane on fire little man on fire uh, and eventually this would go on and on. And he uh, came out and said, I was shot down in a plane um, and that went down in fire. Uh, and eventually the, they kept asking him, what do you mean you were shot down a plane? And over time, this young boy said, I was shot down by the Japanese. Um, at one point, he, his father was looking through a book and there was a picture of Iwo Jima, the island. And James looked over and said, there, that's where I died. Um, and, and, and how old is James at this point? It, it, all of this goes from basically two to four. So this is okay. very young age, about 2000, 2002, all of this is happening. So it wasn't like it was today in terms, I mean, there was access to being able to do some research, but not like we know it today in terms of the internet, how powerful it is today. So it did take a while for the father to really follow up on some of these things. Some key moments, again, I will try to be brief it because it's an amazing story. And it can, like I said, it, it, you can make a movie about it. Um, the father asked him, OK, so at one point, um, James's traumatic play really took over. It wasn't just nightmares. He was he had toy airplanes. He was, everything was a plane. He had planes that he could ride around in the backyard and he had toy planes and he would smash the planes into their coffee table so much so that 
there's a picture that Jim has, Jim Tucker, of the wood coffee table just pockmarked with dents from these toys. He would just crash these planes. And it was traumatic play. It's an actual thing, as if this boy had experienced trauma. And he was saying that he his plane flew off of a boat. Uh, before it was shot down. And the father said, well, what was the name of the boat? And the boy said, James said, Natoma. And his father said, no, that's that sounds like a Japanese name. I think you have that wrong. And being pretty precocious, little James said, no, dad, it was Natoma. It's an American uh, boat. And it tur turns out that a little bit of research over time, there was actually in the Iwo Jima region, Iwo Jima region of the war, there was a aircraft carrier known as the Natoma Bay. So he didn't get Bay right, but he named Natoma correctly. The father asked him, was there anyone else on the boat with you that you can remember? And this little boy literally said a full name. He said, Jack Larson. And it turns out years later, they discovered there was a Jack Larson who flew off of the Natoma Bay. And in fact, we actually have an image from the military that shows that James, James Houston Jr., the person that eventually James Leininger was identif they identified as potentially the pilot that he claimed to have been, who died in World War II, was flying right next to another pilot named Jack Larson. Again, how a three-year-old or a four-year-old would know these things at a time, like I said, 2000, 2002, where it would be very difficult for people to get that level of detail about one mission in the Pacific theater of World War II. Um, so again, it goes on and on. Jack Larson was eventually found. He didn't die. He's the one who confirmed that it, James Houston fits the story that James Leininger was telling. Um, he was the only person who died that day was this James Houston Jr. One last thing that really is fascinating is early on, James Leininger, the boy, would draw part of that traumatic play. He would draw pictures of planes on fire and bullets whizzing past the plane, and he would sign them James 3. And when his parents said, well, what are you, what is, is it because you're three years old? And he said, no, it's because I'm the third. I'm the third James. And he even did that when he was four years old. So it became clear that, yeah, that wasn't because he was saying his age. It turns out that James Houston Jr., when they identified this pilot who died in that war, he was James Houston Jr., which means his father was James, which means James Leininger was James, the third James. Again, how a boy would know that he was the third James when James Houston Jr.'s name wasn't even found until many years later. Um, it's fascinating. Marietta, would you like to add to that? Um, I actually want to go back. I think Philip Gray uh, gave an amazing overview of this case. It's very extensive. There's a lot more, but this is a great coverage of the basis of the case. But I want to go back and talk a little bit uh, big picture, uh, going back to the corroboration versus verification. And I want to talk a little bit about the protocol that Dr. Stevenson um, essentially pioneered to investigate these cases. So we're talking in most cases about very young children. Um, in this day and age, the parents find us. And there's certain kind of features that tend to be typical in these cases, including how the kids talk about the memories. So they might say, I was so-and-so, um, I miss my old family, uh, I wanna go back to my old family, I wanna go back to my old life. So that's sort of the starting point for the parents to begin to think it might be a past life. And then once the investigators get involved in the case, um, there's a very meticulous effort to, first of all, verify from as many informants as possible, did that child really say this statement? Did Is there evidence that the child really talked about what seems to be a past life? And if the child is providing very specific information like names, uh, like Philip gave, gave examples, names, places that could potentially be verified, 
then there is an opportunity there to do a full blown investigation, trying to now corroborate whatever the child is saying. And that consists of trying to find a unique deceased person who matches the details uh, that the child is providing and the picture of that life they're painting. Um, and it's also important to note that as part of this investigation, there is always an effort to eliminate what we would call a conventional explanation of the child's memories or a normal explanation. So could that child have been uh, exposed to information about what looks like an adult life through a movie or stories that their families have told them, et cetera. So in the case of James Leininger, um, I mean, he showed very, very early signs of interest in aviation, knowledge of planes, starting before he was actually two. Um, so it's it's hard to imagine that this information was planted in him um, by his parents. I think that that's always uh, potential criticism, and this this case has attracted a lot of attention, but. We do have evidence that um, a lot of the information that he was able to recognize, even at the museum, was not available to him at that time. And his parents were very devout Christians, and their metaphysical views didn't really embrace reincarnation. So it was definitely not his parents that kind of prodded him to disclose these things. And that's true. I, I'll we'll tell you one other thing, Nick, that's interesting is um, not only because that's an important point for that specific case, but this is a criticism that comes up an awful lot. People will say, and it's great. Look, it, good to be critical. We are, too. But what skeptical uh, uh, skepticism about this can get very aggressive. And oftentimes they'll say they'll make judgments about these parents. They'll say, oh, they're just trying to get attention. They're just trying to sell a book or they're just et cetera, et cetera. I have a Marietta and I have a paper that's in press right now, meaning it's been accepted peer reviewed paper where we went over our 60 plus year database of all of these cases. And we show one of the findings that we find we we reveal in this paper is that the stronger the case, which in our language, we basically say there's a measure that we have that is strength of case. And the stronger the case, the more likely it is that an anomalous explanation is the best one, right? In other words, we couldn't find a natural explanation for this case. Well, what we found was the stronger the case, the more likely it is that the parents will try to actively suppress their child and say, basically stop, stop saying these things. And even to the point of corporal punishment. So this, I'm not saying there aren't individual cases here or there where parents have thought, maybe I can monetize this interesting story. But over the scope of our aggregated 60 plus years of studying this, that's not what the data tell us. The data tell us that as the case gets more interesting, as it becomes more likely to be a great book, the, the more likely it is that parents want it to go away. 